London is not just some city. Its spirit stands outside of time. Certain places have influenced its citizens. It is not only a setting, but a presence, a character in various films, novels and poems. My name is Philip Röttgers and I search for London's spirit. I think there are two particular ways to explore the powerful and mysterious place that is London, through literature and through walking. Follow me into a secret world. Follow me to London beyond time and place. In this series I will explore its spirit by walking the city and talking to London enthusiasts. I invite you to join me. Together we will discover London beyond time and place. This is Talks Beyond Time and Place. Hello everybody to Talks Beyond Time and Place. My name is Philip Röttgers and my guest today is T.G. Campbell. Uh, I'm very happy to have you as my guest today. T.G., welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, T.G. Campbell is an award-winning crime fiction author and creator of the Bow Street Society. Now, what is the Bow Street Society? The Bow Street Society is a fictional group of amateur detectives operating in Victorian London that feature in the murder mystery writings of the author T.G. Campbell. Each of its civilian members has been enlisted for their unique skill or exceptional knowledge in a particular field derived from their usual occupation. And members are assigned to cases by the society's clerk, Miss Rebecca Trent, and the, uh, based upon these skills and fields of knowledge. Uh, so there are several mystery books and short story collections about the Bow Street Society. So my first question is actually, I mean, I gave a bit of an introduction, but maybe you can explain who or what exactly the Bow Street Society is. So as you say, the Bow Society is the group of um, detectives so they're in Victorian London. And the idea is really that they're ordinary people who have ordinary jobs. So there's a doctor, an illusionist, architect. And the difference is that they use the skills and knowledge from those ordinary jobs to actually solve the crimes. So rather than being sort of retired police officers or people of like a military background, they actually are just yeah, normal people just trying to make ends meet. And so it depends on what case they get called into. It depends on who gets assigned. So you don't always have the same combination of detectives each time. Uh, as you say, Miss Trent is the one who will listen to the potential cases from the clients and decide if they're going to have it or not. And then if they do decide to take it on, then she'll then assign members based upon the skill she thinks will be needed to solve the case. Great, yeah. And I mean, how, how many books or stories are out? So at the moment, there is four um, full length books out, starting with the case of the Cures Client, and there's four short story collections out under the Bosch Society case book, and there's five short stories in each of those. So there's 20 of those. And there's also a short story in the UK Crime Book Club's anthology Criminal Shorts as well. Okay, so quite a lot, quite a lot to discover yes. there, um, <laughs> which I think is great. And uh, so, so, yeah, uh, where did the idea, where did the idea for the Bow Street Society come from? Well, I've always, always had a love of crime fiction, um, particularly Agatha Christie, sort of Hercule Poirot, um, sort of the golden age sort of era of crime fiction. But I sort of realised that a lot of crime fiction um, only focuses on one detective or if they do have more than one, it's just like a partnership. Um, also, I say they tend to focus on people who are either um, part of the police or have had sort of like some police background or military background. And I was just sort of thinking, what about just people who are just the ordinary person in the street? What, you know, they surely have skills that are applicable to, you know, investigating crimes. Um, so really sort of wanted to do something that was a bit different, tried to do something that's pushing the boundaries of the genre by having multiple detectives, but not just having a group of detectives that you meet every time, but a group of detectives that does change, it's quite dynamic. And just generally just trying to, say, push that boundary. And, but also the basis really is so that people can actually envision themselves as being part of the British society. The difference is when you read sort of things like um, Help Your Power, then you're all sort of very much sort of looking at it from the outside. Whereas the both society, you can actually just by having an ordinary job yourself, you can actually envision yourself being a member as well. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, that's true. And yeah, as you say, uh, Agatha Christie. I mean, um, I, I read a bit about it in the when I researched for our talk that you were influenced by her. But when I read some of your 
your stories, I also thought, yes, of course, there's, there's Agatha Christie in there. And also, I, I think a bit of Arthur Conan Doyle, the whole mm. Sherlock Holmes thing, of course, I was reminded of that as well, but also because of the Victorian, of the setting in the Victorian uh, period. Yeah, because of course, Arthur Christie was a fan of Conan Doyle, and she was um, a fan of the Sherlock Holmes stories, and it was her, based upon her sisters uh, telling her to dare, daring her to write a detective story that she ended up with the mysterious of Harry Styles. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, one one author influences the other. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. It great. keeps going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it keeps going. Yeah. We we'll, maybe we'll we'll find someone who's who's going to be influenced by you then in the end. That would be nice. <laughs> that would be yeah, maybe. Who yeah, knows? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you know, you don't know. Yeah. And and what kind of story emerges from that? That would be interesting to it would be very interesting yeah to see yeah, what, yeah that, how that went yeah so um as you said the um it's set in the victorian period mm -hmm. so how and when did your interest in the victorian period and, and its literature also begin well i've always had interest in sort of crime fiction from other eras say Ab christie is sort of that sort of 1920s onwards sort of era but when I was at um, university, as part of my English studies degree, we actually studied Victorian literature. We I did a module on um, consumerism, um, so that was really interesting. Sort of reading like, *Ladies Paradise*, um, read um, *How We Consume Pride and Prejudice*, um, also various Dickens books, which I really enjoyed. Um, so that's where it sort of stemmed from there, really. But it also is connected to my love of um, true crime and the, the history of the police. Obviously, the Metropolitan Police was formed in 1829. So it's just that fascination with how it sort of was created, how it evolved during those early years and, and really sort of became what it is today, really. So those two things is what really sort of drew me to the Victorian era and why I actually specifically wanted to write in that period as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, I also studied, uh, it, it was called English Studies and then English Literatures and Cultures mm. in the MA. And we also... Yes, of course, co covered some Victorian literature, but we also read uh, Who Killed Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie. So, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I was just reminded of that. So what do you think? Why are still, why are so many people still fascinated by the Victorian era? I think it's one of those eras that superficially is diff quite different to our own era. But I think it comes down to the fact that I remember I um, went to a, a historical fiction, writing historical fiction workshop, and she said that even though sort of superficially things change and technology changes, people will always fundamentally be the same. So we can still, even though it's obviously a very long time ago, we can still connect to the people of that era on a very fundamental level. You know, human nature yeah. generally uh, is something that we can always connect to. So um, I think people also are more interested in different aspects of the Victorian era, because obviously you always have the representation of the extremes of people in extreme poverty or people who are really wealthy um, but I'm sort of more interested in sort of just the ordinary just people in between just the people who are just trying to make ends meet just trying to get you know um, get through the week so I think let's say people just generally just still fascinated by it because they can still relate to the people who lived in that era yes yeah I, I agree with that I think yeah that's that's definitely part of the fascination or maybe yeah the fascination mm. in general. Is there something particular that fascinates you, uh, especially you, uh, about the era? As I say, it's that just the ordinary. It's just the people, the middle class sort of people who you know got to, um, their own job and just you know trying to make ends meet. But I think it's also how you know things have evolved um, and how you know sort of society's attitudes have, have evolved. But I think the biggest area which fascinates me is sort of the culture. Of the police at the time, sort of a lot yeah. of paternalism and that sort of in, in, in how on the outside it's sort of very organized and so it's very bureaucratic, but it's also that underlayer of you know the unwritten rules and that kind of culture and how very much when you were a policeman back then it was it was your whole identity, it wasn't just a job, it was right. who you were. Yeah. You defined everything about you, and even when you weren't on duty, you were still considered on duty and you're considered a representative of the police. Yes. So all your behavior and your thoughts and everything were very much sort of managed and expected to act in a certain way so all that sort of fascinates me as well yeah i understand that and i think uh, correct me if i'm wrong you have previously worked for a charity assisting i'm going to read this <laughs> uh, <laughs> for a charity assisting witnesses through the 
a process of giving evidence at court and for another organization aimed at assisting current and ex-offenders into training and or employment. So I think that might have also uh, had an impact of you uh, on you and also on the on the the uh, stories that you write. Oh, yeah, definitely, especially because um, I was the two roles that I did were very much sort of uh, administrative, um, but particularly the one with the witnesses. I was actually based at the court, my local courthouse, and so I did sort of work. Um, even though we weren't part of the criminal justice system, we also we did work closely with like um, the members of staff on site and sort of the witness care unit and the police and everything. So it was really interesting to be able to see how the system works and you always think of these things as being they must be really highly organized and really slick and when you're actually part of the system you realize actually it's really not and but that's basically because it's built on you know human nature it's built upon you know the human element and whenever you have that it's always going to be quite chaotic but it was fascinating you know learning about how sort of magistrates court hearings and crown court hearings work and all these different elements that you didn't necessarily realize was involved um it's really interesting but also you definitely got an idea of the human impact of crime and even if somebody wasn't necessarily a, a direct victim of that crime it could be that they were reminded something happened to them years before and we were never um, permitted or you know, expected to know the details of a case because we were um, an unbiased service so we but we supported both prosecution and defense witnesses but say so you, you always you know you i'd always ring up the witnesses first and see if they've been to court and if they hadn't been to court then would arrange something called a pre-trial visit where they could go to an empty courtroom and be shown around by a trained volunteer and explained like you know who's who in the courtroom what's going to happen and but say you just you know sometimes it was literally just somebody just listen to doesn't listen, listen to them basically because they would be reminded of something that happened to them years before so it was you know definitely gave the insight of how even the smallest crime can have a mass, massive impact on somebody's life even if sort of legally it's not seen as a serious crime mm. so it's definitely an awareness that i do bring to my um, books and that how yes there is that mystery that element there's that sort of clue puzzle element which is the fun aspect of it but it's always that underlying human impact of crime that you should always be aware of as well yes definitely, definitely yeah right yeah so um when did you start writing maybe your own fiction in general but also Bow street society uh, well, the first Bow Society book came out in 2016, but I'd sort of started sort of playing around with crime fiction and sort of um, that sort of clue puzzle format when I was about 14, 15. Um, and for my friend's 60th birthday, I wrote a short novella um, based upon that format. Um, that's never been published. I don't know if it actually ever, ever will see the light of day, um, but that's basically... <laughs> One one day you you are, you're gonna have to to publish that as the that was the real first. <laughs> yeah, first yeah. Work. So that was that was more very much um, sort of based in the 1930s or sort of more that sort of like Chris sort of uh, style. Um, it was very short. I might have to like revisit that and rewrite it. But that was what I first did to sort of play around with that format. And then I did a few other things. And actually, even at one point, I attempted a epic fantasy which was an absolute epic failure so it's definitely not seen the light of day <laughs> I, I think many people tried that i also did i also tried writing fantasy but yeah yeah I mean, somehow story... everybody most of most of the authors i've talked to in some on, during some stage in their in their life they try to write fantasy yeah it was more because my, <laughs> yeah, my my friend at school she used to write fantasy so i used to write crime so we we swapped genres and that was what it, that's where it started out was see if we could actually write in each other's genre and yeah we, it didn't work <laughs> but i just had, the, had an idea i don't know if you let the um if there there's also the element of time in the Bow street society so right now it's it's set in the 1890s but if they if the stories develop you're going to come one day maybe you'll, you'll end up in the 1930s and then you can <laughs> yeah possibly yeah i mean that the books at the moment are set in 1896 um and the time time does go forward in the books so um eventually it well in a few couple of books time it will actually change the year um Sorry, yeah yeah it's 897 but i mean i am sort of toying with the idea of sort of doing like spin-off books where you, you do sort of jump ahead in time to see where characters are like I say, in like the 1920s, how where where they end up basically, um, but at the moment, yeah, yeah that's yeah. But it's it's it's, it's, it's interesting sort of how I think living in that time period is it would be quite tangible. Everything could change so dramatically between sort of 1896 to like the, you know early 20th century. Yeah. It would be interesting to see how certain characters would react to that and how they would adjust to that, if at all. 
Yeah, that's right. So you already mentioned a bit um, kind of which literature and works have in, uh, influenced you and your writing. Mm. But uh, has, have there been any specific works where you say there was a huge influence, maybe apart from Agatha, Agatha Christie and then Arthur Conan Doyle or what? Yeah, I do. Oh, I, was, I do actually have a copy. This, uh, this book is actually, I can't just see it actually, can you? Um, it's, the front, uh, hold it in front of your face. I think we can see it then just for a moment. No, a bit closer to the camera, please. No, it's not working. No, basically what it is, it's, it's, writing, it's writing crime fiction by H.R.F. Keating. Mm -hmm. And this was the book that I actually used as a guide when I wrote my the first clue puzzle book when I was 16. Um, and it actually explains the elements of the classical blueprint of Agatha Christie. So basically this has sort of been my Bible ever since then. Um, I've also, the other book that I've used quite heavily, especially in the Bow Society books, is a book called The Queen's London, mm -hmm. and it was actually published in 1896, and it was created to mark the, uh, one of the jubilees of Queen Victoria, and it includes photographs and paintings of different areas of London in 1896, along with descriptions. So when right. I then write about real places in London, I can actually use that as a basis for actually to describe them, how they were back in that precise year. Great, yeah. So, great, yeah. Great source book in, in, in that way. For, for yeah. That. yeah. So, um, as I said, the main character is uh, Miss Rebecca Trent, but as you also said in the introduction, there are uh, artists, an illu illusionist, uh, an architect, a veterinarian. Uh, mm -hmm. So, how do you create your characters? Um, so, what I would say, first of all, is that even though it seems that Miss Trent is actually the main character, the actual main character in all the books is the Bosch Society itself, that is, as the collective. Yeah. That's what I've tried to do, is that, that actually rather than having just one particular character, it's, um, she's very important, obviously. But she's the, the one actual, where everything comes comes together, so. Yeah, 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 that she, yeah she, she basically keeps them all in check, basically, yeah, so, but in the, the idea is that it's the Bosch Society itself who's the main character. But in terms of creating the characters, um, sort of, I just, tend to sort of start with sort of their occupation, what kind of occupation would I need for this particular mystery, yeah. um, and then go to their name. Um, I always write a crowd profile for each character, which I then update once, obviously, as things going along. So obviously, not quite a few characters will reappear in different books. You've got to make sure you keep track of what's happening. Um, but, but very much with the characters is, and their occupation is, is very much sort of dictated by the research. So you have to, you almost have to sort of find out where the occupation is now in modern times and then rewind it back to what it would have been like in 1896 because yeah. then that could then influence um where they live and what what kind of you know financial social status they might have had could they have afforded to actually have been in that occupation also it can obviously affect the gender as well of the character um, but i do try to include as many sort of strong female characters as possible i try not to yeah. fall into that assumption that all women were suppressed and yeah. couldn't do anything um because that wasn't necessarily the case um so i do try to include those sort of strong female characters as well but the very much the creation of the characters comes down to so it's especially the main characters the members um is their occupation yeah yeah but yeah. yes i i already thought that when i when i read some of the stories and when i did a bit of the research i thought oh you include very strong strong women and i like that it's not just mm -hmm. you know the, the, the men the men are the, the ones that do everything but it's kind of equal in your stories i, I like that yeah thank you have, have there been any uh, real life inspirations for some of the characters <laughs> um some people have said to me they think that miss dexter who's the artist if he's based upon me oh. i wouldn't um <laughs> i think you as a writer you always put a part of you into your characters so i would say possibly it's uh one element of her personality might be more me in terms of she can be quite demure I think that's part of me um but in terms of other um, inspirations it's really sort of I suppose it, you know it's who you'd like to meet I suppose and who you find the most interesting right. and, I just tried, and also I try to not just include strong women but I also try to include just different areas of society try to not just have like younger people mm. try to have old people as well as like people who might have like a physical impairment um but try to present it that it's that's just part of who they are that's not that doesn't define who they are yeah. um but, in, but i think that's as far as it goes in terms of real life you know inspiration i try, I try not to include real life historical figures in my work because 
I don't think I could ever do them justice. Mm, I understand um, that. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting how nowadays it's almost like the way that the copyright expires on like, authors' works is almost like the copyright expires on their identity as well. So now you see sort of Charles Dickens solving crimes with people and you see, yeah. you know, um, Oscar Wilde has been solving crimes and like, you know, it's, but I, I'm sort of very wary of doing that, including sort of real life, real life people because I don't think I could do them justice. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, I think I read somewhere what I do when I, I mean, up until now, I, I, I never really published anything where I wrote uh, fiction because I, I started many things, but I never finished them. Or I was never that satisfied. But when I um, when I wrote fiction, I often had um, kind of, of characters from 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 films and movies and, and series, sometimes from other books in mind. Just sometimes just the the uh, appearance, the outer appearance. Mm, when I it's a starting I point, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I read somewhere that. Um, you thought about uh, Jerome Flynn, Flynn of Game of Thrones yeah. and River Street as, yeah. uh, as as the inspector John Conway of Scotland Yard. Yeah. And that's funny because when I, I started writing, uh, uh, it's set in modern day London, but I, when I started writing some kind of crime fiction, I also had him, Jerome Flynn in mind for the inspector. Just, just the, the image. Pretty busy. <laughs> you know, that, that, was, that was funny. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk about some possible... Uh, actors and actresses for for the characters in a moment i just mm. wanted to ask you do you have a favorite character of all of your i mean there's probably a bit of you in every one of them just but yeah um it changes to be honest but at the moment um i think the, the inspector conway character is my favorite one at the moment because it is that that character is allowing me to explore that underbelly of the metropolitan police and its hierarchy at that time um and i was just i'm just fascinated by this idea that it's not just a job, it's your whole identity and, and how it's, it just engulfs every single facet of your life and mm -hmm. how you can just literally spend your whole adult life just dedicating yourself to this service. And it's just the kind of, because you, to be in that sort of job, especially I found this worth with the witness service, you have to have a be a particular type of person. Yeah. You have to be emphatic, but at the same time, you've got to be able to step back and switch off your emotion to a certain degree. Because you, you, it's no good if somebody's falling apart, you need to be the outer strong to be able to like support them. But at the same time, you've got to be able to give the information without sort of leading them along. So very much the witness service, we will very much provide the information without actually sort of telling them what to do. So it's just to be able to give them that informed choice. But at the same time, you could have somebody it literally floods the tears down the phone, but you've got to be able to switch off your emotions enough to be able to keep, you know, to calm down and also be able to sort of just mm. give that information and show them they have that support. So it's all very much linked to that sort of psychology of that kind of person. And so I think for that reason, and obviously then putting back into the Victorian era within that context is even more fascinating because how that would affect um, that job and how that would affect your identity as well. It's just all really just most multiple layers. It's just, I just find really fascinating. Yeah, it is definitely. Yeah. Um, so did you, um, I was always wondering, did you choose uh, Bow Street because it was kind of the first, where were the first police force of, of London was? Well, yeah, it was, well, yeah, that, that's obviously, uh, it's, and that's very much under hot debate, isn't it, but it was the first, it was an organized police force. Yeah, right. Um, but I think, yeah, I've also, because I had actually like um, watched years ago this other. Uh, Channel 4 docudrama City Advice, which follows the Fielding brothers. But I mean, what I found most interesting about them was the fact that one of them was completely blind, uh, but he was still able to function as a magistrate and he, he was able to recognize over a thousand criminals just by the sound of their voice. And being somebody who has a visual impairment themselves, I found that really inspirational that even back then, somebody who was, wasn't blind from birth, he was um, blind at a young age. Um, could actually still be successful and still actually be really respected so that's really sort of where my fascination with that sort of that sort of side of it comes from but yeah the, i've wanted to do both Street because you're into homage to how it all started yeah 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 uh yeah that's really fascinating i, I don't think i heard about him the the blind magistrate blind but yeah. yeah the blind big bow street yeah <laughs> yeah but that's that's fascinating and yeah, yeah of yeah. course and then in, uh, uh, recognizing uh, criminals by the sound of their voices and yeah that's that's yeah yeah um so uh, as i said as you also said there are not also the books there's also the Bo, uh, Bo street society casebook 
the mm -hmm. collection of short stories. So it seems to me as uh, in any way that you, you always seem to find inspiration for new stories. So do you find it difficult to write uh, the stories or do they come naturally to you? Um, it, it can be quite difficult because one rule that I've given myself with the short story is that there should be no murders in them. So whenever I come up with an idea, it always inevitably starts going into like a murder plot. I'm like, no, it can't be a murder plot. It has to be something else other than that. So that's one element which I do find difficult to actually mm. um, sort, of, sort of get around, really. Um, but then that sort of challenges me to actually think of something else, basically. But um, with the short stories, I always start with who do I, which two members do I want to investigate mm. this particular case? And then I'll then go from there in terms of trying to form the idea. Because obviously whatever the crime is, needs to be somebody they can actually use their skills to actually solve. So it's no good to just turn up, ask a couple of questions and they just solve it based upon that. It needs to be right, well, we've got this knowledge, apply this knowledge to then be able to have the key to solve the mystery. Um, so it can be quite difficult to think of new ideas, to be honest. Yeah. But, it, but it's very good to be able to sort of expand the universe and expand the characters and beyond just the murders as well. So. Yeah. Do, you, do you set yourself a... a kind of limit uh, like I want to finish a new story until next week or anything like that? Um, I released the book, the short, short, short stories in serialized form. So I released one every quarter, the first part of one every quarter in the newsletter. Um, so I have to, it's basically, I, I normally, during the year I normally write three and then I write two more and then they go in the collection of Christmas. So basically my, the, my target for the year is to write five. Um, at the moment, my overall target is to have 10 books in the main series and then have 10 collections alongside that. So be, at the end, it'll be 50 short stories I need to write all together. So quite, I've got quite a few to go yet. <laughs> yeah, quite a few to go, but, but you manage, you manage to, to write very good stories anyway. And, and well, thank you. So you, are, you are always uh, have, have uh, inspiration. I think it, it won't, you won't find it very difficult. So also because uh, I, I imagine and I, I think, yeah, you put that you put a lot of research in, into your stories, obviously. Mm. So and, and um, maybe I also already said that to you, but when I talk to, to other writers uh, and including me, it's often the um, that they say that the, the research, of course, often takes more time than, than the writing itself. But, mm. but can be as fun or more fun <laughs> sometimes <laughs> than the writing itself, finding out new things and, and uh, stories. So do, do you agree with this or is it, do you find it difficult to, to do the research? I love doing the research and I yeah. particularly love doing, you, doing research with actual original documents and sources from the time. I try to get as close to that period as possible. I mean, um, I use um, Oxfam's online shops antiquarian book section quite a lot. I buy quite a lot of books from there because they have actually got quite a good section of books from the 1890s, like the 18, like that, half the 1800s. They're not in perfect condition, but in the day, I don't want them for what they look like. I want them for what they've got in them. Right. Because um, I think that's the best source you can get if you're writing oh, yes. in that period. Yeah, from actually the voices of from the people actually who were there. Um, and I was lucky to go, enough to go a few years ago to the Lib National Archives and they had a Victorian crime evening. They actually had out the original documents from the Jack Lipper case. Oh, wow. So they had some of the police statements there. They also had the letter from Oscar Wilde was there as well. Um, we couldn't touch them, but it was just fascinating just to see. You just think it's amazing that those documents have survived all this time. Because nowadays, it's such a far away culture. Everything's digital. Yes. You wonder if that would actually even exists but you just think how many people have looked at these documents how many people have actually yeah you know handled them it, it's it's just amazing yeah really. so but yeah definitely find the research the most fun bit and what i always find really interesting is how like you can plot out your story and then you do the research and then that will actually mean you have to change your story particularly when it comes to sort of like um the forensics and sort of the pathology types type of thing it's all big well we know what the, the knowledge is now but what was it like then could what could they realistically detect back yeah. then so that's that's really interesting i do find the research part of it really yeah. fun to be honest yeah yeah i understand that and as you say i mean the the interesting is is uh, interesting thing is you can like find the the, uh, the the documents about the ripper case you can find it all online as you say you can read it all on the internet but it's it's still different to to see them in front of you the originals yeah, yeah. Still, 
there's still something something about it. Yeah, um, so the because um, yeah. yeah, the Metropolitan Police Service um, historical collection will be they're moving at the moment to a new site, but they will be opening a new region room sometime this year. Obviously, once COVID restrictions are lifted, mm -hmm. and they've um, I've I've, done, I've actually interviewed the curator there, and she said to me that they do actually have Inspector Aberline's sketchbook, not sketchbook, scratch, scrapbook, sorry, of all the articles that were the cases that he'd been involved in. It was personal scrapbook. They actually have that as part of the collection wow. you can request to see and it's got his antiquated notes but said, interestingly there's no articles about the Jack Ripper case in there yeah I heard that uh, yeah but yeah. yeah that's that's really interesting but I would love to see that that would be yeah I would love to see that as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said if you go to these places you like click I need to I need to go have something in mind otherwise I will literally spend a week there just looking right. at everything they've got <laughs> right yeah yeah but you must uh, you, you must also have a quite a quite a collection now I mean with all the research you do and all the things you read <laughs> yeah yeah i've got a one well i've got a whole shelf in my on my bookcase it's literally mm. this literally's got contemporary books from the 1800s that i've bought just this year so i've got um books about um palmistry i've got books about um sort of the kind of the mind of the face of so like you know how they use their face to sort of determine people's characteristics and obviously you've got to be careful in terms of obviously how that perceived now it's a different how it's perceived then um but it's just, but also got something as mundane as like um books on ceramics mm. i've got a, bo a book on um tools in the workshop from the 1890s so if they go to a workshop they can know what exactly what tools they've got I've got recipe books mm. um but yeah i've got i've also got other books that are more contemporary about um i've got the official encyclopedia of scotland yard um i've got a book about the writer's guide to poisons i've also got another book which is really good called the secret poisoner mm -hmm. so whereas the writer's guide to poisons will tell you the effects of poisons are secret poisoner tells you gives you case studies of how they detected poisons in criminal cases during the 19th century so it gives you that sort of scientific side of things and how they you know the limits of actually being able to detect poisonings in murder victims back at the time as well so that's been really oh. helpful yeah sure yeah huh. So you you could you're probably an expert on most of these things now. If uh, I, if I, I want to, I to know anything about a particular subject from the 1890s, I'm going to ask you. Maybe you have the, maybe you know it. Or if, if you don't know it right away, you have the book way where we can. Yeah, well, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. So, and you also on your website you also write a blog uh, about mm -hmm. Victorian Britain, and. Uh, so, so was there something like the strangest story of fact about Victorian Britain that you found out? Um, this, I did, what, what, what I found most interesting was the history of the word copper, but uh, of all the ones I've actually done for the blog, it has to be the uh, Memento Mori pictures of like the Victorian tendency to take pictures of their deceased loved ones. Yes. Um, because quite often that would be the only time that they could afford to have those photographs done. Um, I think that sort of spot speaks volumes about how the Victorians weren't as squeamish about death as we are nowadays, mm. because unfortunately it was a common, you know, part of life back then, basically. Yeah. Um, but in terms of what I've actually done for the blog, that's, I would say, the most interesting, strangest fact I found out so far. Yeah. I remember when I read that for the first time and I saw some of the photographs, I, I was like, whoa, I'm, I don't know, I was <laughs> 17 or, or something like that, but I... I didn't expect that because I, at that time, I didn't know that much about the, the old period and about the Victorians. But I was, wow, this is strange. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's strange. A but photograph it's... with with a dead loved one. That's really strange. But yeah, as you say, it was. Yeah. They, they had a different attitude to, to dead and, and to dead people. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So, um, you also do great and atmosphor atmospheric uh, readings of your stories uh, that can be heard and found on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. have, you, have you also thought about doing the stories as, as audiobooks and also with several speakers? Because I, th I think some of them might really work. Re I mean, what you do also works. It's great. But I yeah, sometimes yeah. think they, they would be also very nice if you had, you know, the different characters, different voices. Yeah, I am actually in the process of working on actually getting that sorted. Mm -hmm. So I have got some voice actors um, who will be doing you know, different voices for different characters because very much obviously because there's several members in the society and you do have certain scenes where they sat around a table having mm -hmm. a meeting about the case, you very much do need that 
difference and a distinction between their voices rather than having one person reading it. Um, but my intention to have, so we'd have one actor doing all the, all the female dialogue, but changing their voice to be able to change the accents and everything. And have another actor who would do the male dialogue, but again, changing their voice and act, accents to, to affect the characters. And then I'll be then doing the description and narration in between. Yeah. So, so that is what I'm working on at the moment. Yeah. If you ever need anyone with a bit of a German accent, <laughs> ask me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please do. Please do. Oh, yeah, I will do. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. Um, you've also been at several book signings and events. Was there, uh, was there one that stuck out that was really special in a way, or were they all, were they all great? <laughs> Oh, they, they, they've all been great. I mean, so far I've actually only done uh, the UK Indie Fest because I think I, had, I was down to do a couple or do a few last year, but obviously because of COVID they were postponed. Um, but I have also done the uh, History Festival in Northampton. So it wasn't actually a book signing, but um, that was a lot of historical reenactments. Um, but the indie, UK Indie Fest in Bradford, obviously, was really good. I did uh, my first talk there uh, about how to make a book trailer so that was really good and they're, they're a really great bunch of people and I think book events in generally for the indie author community is really supportive and you get to meet some really good you know really great people and you can network and everybody's really keen to you know help promote each other and to help each other out wherever they can so if you can get involved in book science it's definitely worth doing right yeah yeah and as you say it's often about the, the networking and getting to mm. know people and i think i also read that uh, when you went to one of the you know, white shepherd society meetings you, you met some people there and there was there were also i think you were right or am i, am I wrong i went to the jack Ripper crime conference yeah okay yeah yes yeah, yeah. So, yeah so that is um so that, that was basically set up to um, for bipolarists to meet um, annually to discuss their latest theories on um, that of the crimes. But that particular conference had other cases, talks on other cases. They had a talk on a Lord Lucas disappearance. Mm -hmm. They had another talk on the BTK killer. But they had a talk from Professor David Wilson, who is a really sort of eminent um, criminologist in the UK. So I got to meet him. That was brilliant. And I also met um, Martin Fido, who had co-authored the um, Scotland yeah. Encyclopedia. Um, he actually signed my copy, so that was really good. That's um, but that's good, yeah. yeah, so that's I think that is due to be held again this year. It didn't happen last year, I think it's due to held held again this year, but that is very much sort of academics and people who are interested in the Jack Ripper crimes. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's the thing. You meet people, you get to know other people, and then you have mm. the you can kind of um, share the knowledge. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Would I I would have loved to to meet uh, Martin Fido, but yeah um he was definitely a character <laughs> yeah yeah i heard about i heard some stories about him from from various people and yeah I, I think. yeah he was great person. um so would you like to go back in time and visit london in the 1890s i would but i would probably want to stipulate that i if i could just go back and observe and not necessarily interact Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to accidentally change history. Oh, yeah. Um, but, I, but I also think it would be very, if you could just go back and observe and not be known that you were there, I think you could find out a lot more than if people, especially, think especially if it was a woman as well, um, you wouldn't necessarily have as much access to places. But I think if you could just go back and observe and just, is that sort of fly on the wall type thing where you could sort of watch people interactions and I could like just watch the police in Scotland Yard or playing about obviously them knowing I was there. So I would love to be able to do that, but I wouldn't necessarily want to go back and live there. Yeah, yeah, me too. I would, <laughs> uh, the same, same as you. I would probably, I would like to go back and just observe, mm -hmm. not, you know, not interacting because, as you say, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to mingle with the past. I, I don't know. It would be good to actually see if you actually, what your research tells you is actually right as well. Right. Yeah. Better go back and double check. <laughs> yeah. Would also be interesting, but that's, that's another thing if you then, if you went there and say, as you say, women don't have that much, I didn't have that much access. You, and you, mm. you would go there and say, in 130 years of time, <laughs> I, yeah. I would be allowed to go in there. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> that would probably ca cause a lot of, of chaos. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, you already mentioned the book uh, where the, with, with, with the Queen Victoria uh, for, for the Jubilee and with the, with the, images of London and, and of locations but have you also been to to places that you write about uh, in London uh, now for for research or when you wrote the stories 
Yes, I went, I've actually been to Bow Street. Unfortunately, by the time I got to go to Bow Street, the Bow Street Law Court and Police Station actually closed. Mm. Um, but that is, a part of that is due to open, hopefully again this year, as a museum, the Bow Street Police Museum. So I'm going to be one of the first people to go there. Um, but I have been sort of, I, I do try to include real places in London in the books if I can. Um, so I've been to Kew Gardens, the Lily House. Um, I've also visited quite a few of their museums. I've been to the Magic Circle, had a guided tour around there. That was very interesting. I've been yeah. to the old operating theatre in Herb Garrett, which has got the, the original operating table in there. We can actually see all the saw marks and the box of sawdust underneath it, which is very interesting. Um, so I'm quite lucky that I live only about half an hour train journey away from London, so I can go to London quite often. Yeah. Um, I've been to Charles Dickens' house in London as well. So that was really interesting. Um, I think if you can go to the places, it's always best to do that because if you are going to be writing about them, it's, it's good to be able to actually, you know, visualise them. There's right. obviously certain places that I can't go inside of. So the old Scott and Jar building is still there, but it's, it's still used as a government building. So I can't just wander in and be like, oh, I'm just doing research. Don't, worry, don't mind me. Maybe um, you should give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Hello. think they would yeah. let me. But it's good to be able to actually go and see it from the outside though and it's it's weird because you sort of think i write about these places and you do then sort of feel as though in a strange way you sort of feel you've come home you sort of feel like you've got that spiritual connection to them even though obviously you've never been inside you never worked there you just feel you do have that connection with them yeah let me know when you want to go to the bow street society, uh, society bow street museum <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> because i don't also want to go there so yeah i would join you Oh yeah, because um, yeah, it's in the um, old um, mail cells of the old police station. So I was actually lucky to be able to interview a former police officer at the Blosey police station and he sent me a load of photographs when he used to do guided tours around there. Mm -hmm. so he's got the photographs on the inside and everything. So I would, yeah, I will let you know because it's going to be amazing to be able to go in the building and be like, oh my God, I'm actually in the building. Right, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's the building that we can, can see behind you, I think. So, yeah. Oh no, this is actually the Boat Society house. This house didn't never actually existed. Um, but the the Bow Street Police Station and Law Courts, it's featured in the book. So they, in terms of geography, the house would be a few doors down from that building that actually existed. So you can visualize where they would be in terms of each other. Yeah. yeah. So as you um, said, this, uh, this, this sketch also appears in the trailer that you did for the case of the curious client. Who, who did the, um, the, the sketches, the, the drawings? So that was Peter Spells, and he is a brilliant um, freelance illustrator who does all the illustrations for my, the, in my, all my front covers have got a central illustration, so he's done, he's done those sketches, and he also did the ones for the short story collections as well. He's very patient and very talented, so um, we work really well together. Yeah, okay. And it's they're they're great and very atmospheric also. So uh, yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he has actually got a website. You just put into you put into um, Google uh, Peter Spells and his website will come up. And he does mm -hmm. take commissions for other book authors. And he does he's done postcards and posters and everything. So if you did want to commission him, then he is open to commissions. Great. Yeah, I'm gonna add the li the link to the website. So yeah. while you right. said that, <laughs> I would have, <laughs> would have put that in by then. Cool. <laughs> um, so as I said, the, there's the, the film trailer, basically, mm -hmm. or just the, the trailer for the uh, case of the curious client uh, that can also be found on YouTube. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a bit about that? Um, yeah. About so the... that was filmed at the, in the Victorian parlor at Milton Keynes Museum, which is my local museum. And it stars um, Sabrina Poole as Miss Trent, and it has um, Daniel Toll as uh, Mr. Oswald Borden from the Gaslight Gazette. And, both of them um, brilliant, I think. Both of them, they really, especially Sabrina Poole. I, I thought, oh yeah, that's that's Rebecca Trent. <laughs> yeah, it's, really yeah, yeah. No, it's amazing because people saw it and like, oh, I didn't realise Miss Trent was that young. I'm like, yes, <laughs> she, she is actually that young. Um, but I think most people are just blown away by the quality of the trailer when it actually first came out um yeah. i that was all self-funded so i i wrote um directed and produced that i had um james westlake um did the uh cinematography and the um, lighting for that he also took photographs about on the day um darius alexander did the sound and obviously it had like tim wells i think it's colin c i think did the um voice acting for the illustrator because obviously it had the first bit of the trailer is 
obviously Mr. Borden coming into the parlour and sort of trying to get a bit more dirt about the society of Miss Trent and about the recent case. Um, and then it goes, she again gives him the report and then it goes into the flashback, as it were, of the illustrated bit of it, which is, I'll just tell, tell you about the case of Kira's client. Um, and then it goes to the end, obviously. But yeah, and the actual, the, um, the music, musical score in the illustrated bit was um, composed and sort of created by Ilikachi mm -hmm. um, Studio. Um, so yes, it was all original um, content that we created for that. And that's great. Have you ever thought about doing more than, than this trailer? I mean, if you wrote it and di directed it, why well, not? I would, you know? <laughs> so yeah. many people said to me, this would make such a great Sunday night BBC drama. I was like, right. I know, but yeah. but I, I, I couldn't, to be honest, it took me a while to save up to be able to do the trailer. And yeah, I right. wanted the trailer to not just introduce the first book, but introduce society as a whole, so I could keep using it. I think what I would, I mean, obviously if somebody came along to me and said, we would love to make it into a series, I'd be like, yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I think for me personally, what I would love to do once I've actually finished the first, I mean, after 10 books, I probably will then see if I want to write any more or not. But what I'd love to do would be a film, like a photo shoot of all, so different different models and everything. And in character, for the different characters, just have a big picture of all the different characters gathered around Miss Trent, the police and also the, society members that's what i would love to do is actually have them all in costume and actually take photographs of them but i think yeah. i'm very much limited in terms of what i can do in terms of another trailer um so originally i did look into like hiring the old operating theater in london and looking at possibly using the london locations but you get a lot of expense and you've got a lot of red tape you've got especially if you want to use the streets in london you've got to like get permission and it's just it was just like a, what was going to be just a few minutes trailer it just wasn't viable to do that yeah um but obviously, yeah, I would love to, you know, have it as a drama. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would love to, love to see that. Um, maybe, maybe one day, maybe, maybe, maybe someone maybe, wa maybe. watches this talk yeah. and, and <laughs> someone who's responsible and says, "Yes, of, we're going yeah, to do that." Yeah, yeah, because so many people have said to me, "Yeah, it would make a great Sunday night drama." It's like, yeah, it would, you know, but it's, yeah. it's whether or not people would I, want yeah. to make it. <laughs> so, so which, which. Now we come back to the actors and actresses. Do you have anyone in mind to to play the characters? So yeah, as I say, only ones. Yeah, Jerome Flynn would definitely be Inspector Conway. I would love for Sabrina to reprise her role as Miss Trent. I think in my mind, she there's nobody else can play her now. That's you know, she was yes. brilliant in the book trailer. Um, and I think you know, I would, one of my other favourite actors is Mark Warren, but I'm not quite sure who he would play now. But in terms other than that, though, I haven't really got anybody specifically in mind. Who would love to be in it? I think the two main ones would be Jerome Flynn and uh, Sabrina Paul. Definitely. Yeah. But that's good. So you you're open to to suggest open to offers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Maybe maybe you'll yeah. get a call afterwards and someone says, "I want to play this role," and I'm also going to find a producer. <laughs> that would be yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Always. So, yeah, I'm definitely open to always open to offers. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So you heard her everybody who's watching <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay so uh what is your next project so i'm currently working on book five in the series um and also i'll be soon be working on uh the next short story um and as i said i was also in the process of working on the um audio books uh, the first audio book um and then i will be putting together the next ambient reading Obviously, it'll be the case of the Gentleman's Gambit for the YouTube channel as well. So, just a few things in the pipeline. <laughs> when when can we expect the next atmospheric reading, ambient reading? That'll be in the next sometime in the next few days. Okay. So, but so if maybe. People, yeah, but I always put a link into my um, newsletter and the Gaslight Gazette. So, if people subscribe to that, they can they can see it in there or just search um, Bosch Society on YouTube and it'll come up on my channel. You can subscribe to that as well, and it'll tell you when new videos are up. I'm going to put it all into the description so people can can find it. So maybe it's going to be online by the time this talk goes online. So yeah, probably maybe. yeah. Yeah, it, I have recorded it actually. Now edit it together and put the sounds in, and then once that's done, it just goes up. So yeah, okay. Do you, do you uh, have you considered um, doing anything of, uh, apart from from Bow Street Society in the in the future? Um, <laughs> as I say, I, I've. As you can imagine, because I mean, with the way the Bow Street Society is, it's the possibilities are endless. Um, yeah. I do very much sort of like the idea of doing sort of spin-offs, but with the character, well, each character having their own sort of spin-off title, and just to see what they do beyond their 
work of the Project Society. Um, but apart from that, I would like to possibly revisit that original book that I wrote when I was 16 and um, sort of release that as a new series. But I think, again, because I said that in the 1930s, I think obviously with the amount of research I do for the Project Society, I think readers would then expect the same level of research mm -hmm. and detail for the, any other new series. So I'd have to decide whether or not it was viable for me to start something completely new or just carry on building on the Bow Society universe. Because I mean, I love the, the Bow Society universe and the characters and, you know, I love the idea of, like I say, moving time forward, seeing where Miss Trent is possibly, because you know, I worked out in the 19, 1920s, she would be like in her 40s. So it'd be interesting to see like what she was doing at that point. Yeah. Um, and I've also got like um, other ideas for, like um, cat, like Dr. Weeks, <clears throat> who is the, the doctor in the mm -hmm. books. He like, you know, um, sort of do a spin-off with him as well. So that's probably what I would do. So yeah, lots of, of, of possibilities, as you say. And oh, yeah, yeah maybe, definitely. Maybe if you write the um, this, the Wall Street Society long enough, you reach in the 1930s and then you can uh, <laughs> you can add your your first story that you wrote when you were 16. <laughs> you oh, can, yeah. you can do it you have a, a cameo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I probably would, once the 10 books are done, I also like the idea of sort of doing like a non-fiction book about Bowship Scientist London, just literally focusing on the locations and oh, the yeah. locations. And you also have like a section of the fictional locations that I include and why I create them as the way I did and what the inspiration is behind, behind them were as well. So that I'll probably do that as well. So that's also a companion book to the series. That's great. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. that's a great idea. I really, I really like that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, nice. Okay. So it's going to, we will have, we'll probably we'll be able to read that soon. Because I don't know about soon, but <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm on. I'm only on book five, so I've got another five books to write after this, and then I'll probably, I'll probably release that after the tenth book. Okay. Okay. So we've got a few years yet. <laughs> yeah, but a few, a few more years of of uh, enjoying the the Bow Street mm -hmm. Society stories up to then. So on your website, you also mentioned your magnificent mug collection, I think from museums <laughs> where you've been. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because I found this very uh, intriguing. Yeah, whenever I go to museums or places of interest, I always go to the gift shop and I always love to get a mug that has the name of the place on it. Because you go to a lot of these gift shops, and it's amazing how some of them don't actually have a mug with their name on it. Yeah. You'll get ones very generic. Um, so when I do go and it is one that's got the name on it, I'm like, yes, I have to have that. So I've actually got, I'm actually running out of room now. I've probably got uh, about 40 odd mug, mugs from different places I've been to. Great. And last year I did uh, Mug May on Twitter. So each day I had a different mug and I linked to the different museums and everything. I was encouraged people to have a look and support them if they could. Um, yeah. But I have, you know, all sorts from... So I did, went to the Crime Museum exhibition um, a few years ago, so I've got a mug from there. I've got a mug from the Sherlock Holmes Coffee House in Whitby. I've got um, a mug from Agatha Christie's Holiday Home, oh. um, I've, you know, down in Torquay. I've got just also you know, Warwick Castle. Um, basically, you name it, I've got it pretty much. So <laughs> I'm gonna. So yeah, probably last last year you couldn't add much uh, or many more marks to the to the collection. No, so, um, unfortunately not. But I do intend to get out and about. Obviously, when I go to the Bowstreet Police Museum, if they've got a gift shop with a mug on it, then I'll be getting it. So yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> you, you should you should do your own marks with Bow Street Society on them. <laughs> um, I, well, in the past, what I have done at, at Christmas, I have done like giveaways where you've okay. got like I've got a one mug specially made. Um, well, I have considered doing merchandise, but I don't, I don't think there's much of a demand for it at the moment. Um, if people wanted it, then I probably could do them, but at the moment, it's very much sort of a one off thing that I do occasionally. I, I, I'd buy one. <laughs> yeah. But I like to do that sort of the quite, rather than a mug, I like to do like the china cups more because i think that's more in keeping with sort of like the era rather than doing like a heavy mug yeah so i did just i did have um, a lady who used to do print onto like really nice china mugs but it's difficult to actually source those kind of mugs now so if i can actually find someone that does that i probably would do the more fine china type mugs with the logo on it so yeah yeah sure yeah i understand that um okay so uh thank you very much TG. Thank you. We're already at the end. That was so quick. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> did I forget anything? Or did do you want to mention anything that I forget forgot to mention? Um, no. To say, like say you mentioned my website, so I'm going to put yeah. that in the put it in the yeah in the bottom yeah. But no, that's that's great. That's that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it was great to have you here today. I'm going, as you said, I'm going to put a link to your website or the society's <laughs> website. Yeah, yes. yeah, um, yeah, because it's yeah, not actually, yeah, because I think oh, I've got on social media and on the website, obviously it's the Bosch Society rather than me. Right. So. I often think about them. Yeah, that's their website. You know, it doesn't matter oh, yeah, well, the yeah, 80s, yeah. 90s, but that's... <laughs> that's <laughs> So yeah, yeah, be, yeah. You ask them like, "What's a computer? What, what <laughs> internet? What's that?" <laughs> oh, yeah, but it would be nice to to somehow include just a, a tiny hint to that somewhere, like one sentence where someone says, "You can check this out on the website." Yeah, in one of the what? future stories, and everybody. Or the <laughs> would be like, what? What? <laughs> what's, the, what's the website? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that would be, or maybe in in the in the. Um, one of the readings but yeah anyway i'm going to put a link to to the website to the society's website to your website into the description thank you and uh, yeah thank you very much uh, yeah, thank you for, for me today time. it's been brilliant it's great to have you here today yes so uh, thank you very much mm -hmm.